listener production. Hi, Sasha Barbagat with you for today's episode of The Briefing. There was talk before Easter that big retailers like Coles would run out of cash over the long weekend. It came after Armaguard, the nation's biggest cash delivery business, announced it was struggling financially. Very few people use cash these days, so it shouldn't come as a surprise the nation's number one cash in transit business is losing money. So what does the potential collapse of Armaguard mean for Australia's cash flow? And is there an argument for bringing cash back? We rely a lot on IT systems and telecoms. They sometimes break down. And if they break down, then the fallback position is using cash. So cash can be very valuable and very useful. In this episode of The Briefing, we investigate the future of cash in Australia. Before that, Antoinette Latouf is here with the headlines. It is Wednesday the 3rd of April. G'day, Sasha. Hello, everyone. So we begin with more on the tragic story of Aussie aid worker Zomi Frankom, who was killed by an Israeli airstrike. PM Albanese is demanding a phone call with his Israeli counterpart after the aid worker was killed when a vehicle she was travelling in was bombed. And this was after it left a warehouse where it had collected food supplies. I have spoken to Zomi's brother. They are, of course, devastated by this news. Uh, This is just an extraordinary tragedy. It's one that they certainly weren't expecting. Anthony Albanese there. So Zomi Francom had been working for the World Central Kitchen when she and six other workers were hit and killed. They'd been travelling in a convoy at the time and the IDF had been notified of their movements and also their coordinates. Among other aid workers killed were three British citizens, a Polish national, a Palestinian and a dual US and Canadian citizen. People are heroes. They run into the fire, not away from it. They show the best of what humanity has to offer when the going really gets tough. They have to be protected. That's US Secretary of State Antony Blinken there. I mean, I hear that, Sasha, and I think the audacity to pretend to have empathy at the moment um, when Blinken says they need to be protected, given the US continues to provide most of the bombs that Israel is dropping. Mm. Uh, Anthony Albanese as we heard earlier, is demanding a meeting with uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, his Israeli counterpart. Uh, The PM does say he has heard from Israel's government but hasn't heard from Netanyahu himself, who overnight has admitted it was an Israeli strike that was responsible for the deaths of these aid workers. He acknowledged that the country's forces had carried out the, quote, unintended strike on, quote, innocent people in the Gaza Strip. There's been widespread condemnation of the strike from world leaders, along with demands for an ex Explanation. While aid organisations are expressing their concerns that this could make it harder for crucial supplies to get to those who need them in Gaza. Yeah, and we know crucial supplies are needed more and more in Gaza, as every leading human rights organisation in the world says that Palestinians in Gaza are either already facing famine or on the brink of famine. And hearing Netanyahu say unintended, I do question how it's unintended, given they had both the coordinates and the route of this aid vehicle. Um, And the PM has said a lot of words, and I I watch closely many times his press conference, um, where he's showing empathy or appearing to show empathy and say, we want full accountability. And that sounds, I guess, good in principle. But what he didn't say was that he would oppose any economic sanction on Israel like we have on Ru- on Russia. What he didn't say is that we would put an end to our military exports to Israel. What he didn't say is that we would cut diplomatic ties. So it's nice to say full accountability, but it's kind of like a condemnation and a slap on the wrists with a bit of wet lettuce. Yeah, I think it'll be one of those things that once... Anthony Albanese has spoken with Netanyahu, you would hope that there would be a stronger response that would come from it. Just a tragic story all round. Bruce Lerriman's defamation trial against Channel 10 and Lisa Wilkinson will be reopened after the TV network won an 11th hour bid to bring new evidence. Justice Michael Lee has agreed to hear from former Channel 7 producer Taylor Auerbach, who has produced a sworn 2,000 plus page affidavit. In it, he claims Lerriman was the source of leaks of Brittany Higgins's private text messages 
and an audio recording of a meeting with Wilkinson and a Channel 10 producer, Antoinette, all of which was leaked to the media. Yeah, Sasha, and this material was included in an electronic brief of evidence, um, but it was not tendered in Lerman's criminal trial. He has previously denied providing the documents, and Justice Slee had been due to deliver his verdict in the defamation case tomorrow in the federal court, but will now instead hear from Orbach, uh, who was working for Seven when the network was courting Lerman for a tell-all interview for the Spotlight program. And there are some pretty eyebrow-raising stuff that this Channel 7 producer claims. Um, And this will come out in court and be tested in court from tomorrow, where we'll be able to provide more details from then. This story blows my mind. A family in Florida has been left rattled after a piece of space junk believed to be from the International Space Station crashed through their roof. It was a cylindrical slab and it weighed about a kilo. It managed to penetrate two stories of their house. And even though it happened last month, Sasha, we're just hearing about it now. Luckily, nobody was hurt. And if you're wondering what space junk is, it's fragments of man-made materials left behind in space. And most space junk is debris that comes from rocket launching materials and disused satellites. Yeah, this story is crazy. NASA has confirmed it's investigating the incident, but Some experts already think they know where it came from, as you mentioned, from the ISS. They think it was a discarded battery pallet that was expelled from the station all the way back in March of 2021. The US Space Command recorded the re-entry of a piece of space debris over the Gulf of Mexico on a path towards southwest Florida at 2.29pm the day that it struck this house, and that was just five minutes before the crash. The homeowners are now demanding answers as to who will pay for the damage. Now, you mentioned the space junk explanation. There's so much more to it, and we did cover it in a previous episode back in June uh, last year. And, you know, this conversation about space junk is I feel only going to keep happening because there's so much crap up there and it's inevitably going to keep finding its way back down to Earth. So according to the European Space Agency, a large space object re-enters the atmosphere in a natural way approximately once a week with the majority of the associated fragments burning up before they reach the ground. That's how they're designed, so that Mm. they don't land on people or their houses. But also with this story, determining who's responsible could be challenging because the batteries were owned by NASA, but they were attached to a structure which was launched by the Japanese space agency. So it could be a while before this family has the answers that they're looking for. And I just imagine the conversation they're going to have to have with their insurance company. It's like, what happened to your roof? It's like, well, (laughs) something (laughs) dropped on it from space. (laughs) Like it's going to it's going to sound like, you know, the dog ate my homework yeah. try, kind of reasoning, but it's going to become more and more common because there are so many private companies shooting rockets into space and nobody's really responsible for who cleans it. And certainly it's hard to determine who's responsible when it re-enters Earth. Mm. You may not be a man, Taylor Swift, but you are an official billionaire. I mean, we knew you were a billionaire, but now you have officially made the rich list. So Taylor Swift is now on the Forbes billionaire rich list for the first time. Her net worth coming in at 1.1 billion US dollars. That's 1.7 billion Australian dollars. Swift's success has been growing from strength to strength. She stole the show at this year's Grammy Awards, becoming the first performer to win the prize for album of the year four times. And of course, who can forget her massive Eras tour, which is still going. And Sasha, the really interesting thing about Taylor Swift, unlike other musicians who become incredibly rich, um, they often do it through clothing lines and other businesses and fragrances. She's largely done it from her music. Her album, 1989, Taylor's version, was also the best-selling vinyl LP of last year. She is joined on the list for the first time by ChatGPT's CEO, Sam Altman. And of the top 10 richest people on the planet listed by Forbes, eight were from the US, six have made their money in 
tech industries, unsurprising. Uh, the CEO and family of LVMH, that's the company that owns luxury goods like Louis Vuitton and Moet Champagne, they came in top with $233 billion US. Elon Musk came in second at 195 and Amazon's Jeff Bezos third at 194 Now, uh, I looked at this because, you know, with Taylor Swift and she wants to be the man and all of that, I was like, how many people on the Forbes Billionaire Rich list are actually women? And I was surprised. It's about 369 out of 2,781. So that's 13.3%. And that is up from uh, 12.8% last year. So slowly crawling Mm. towards equality. Isn't it terrible? I was surprised too that our reaction at 13% was (laughs) by both of us were, oh, this isn't as awful as we thought it would be. (laughs) Um, The richest woman is Francois Betancourt Mayers. Um, She comes in at 15. Um, I think it's interesting that The world's billionaires are growing. So there are more billionaires in the world than ever before. And so all that means is we're all kind of sitting here counting our pennies, worrying about interest rates and rental hikes. And those who are struggling and those who are poor get poorer because of wealth disparity. Those with a lot of cash are just getting richer. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, it's always interesting to kind of uh, dig through this list. Um, Good to see another woman on there. Um, But yeah, let's get up from that 13.3%. Antoinette, thank you for being here for the headlines. Next up is our deep dive onto what the potential collapse of Armagard could mean for cash in Australia. Australia is on the march to what feels like the inevitable end of cash. In 2018, experts were predicting the end of physical currency within a couple of generations. Then COVID hit and sped up the process. In 2022, cash payments made up 13% of transactions, down from 69% in 2007. Sweden became the first country to go completely cashless a year ago, while others are not far behind. There's been an increase lately, especially in small business circles, of people decrying the end of physical money and begging customers to forego card payments. Fans of cash argue we should keep our hard-earned far away from the banks, that it's safer for us to have total control of what is in our wallets. Those arguing against a cashless society have also copped the tinfoil hat treatment, brushed away as paranoid conspiracy theorists. But is that fair? In today's briefing, I'm chatting with Professor Steve Worthington from the Swinburne University School of Business and Law to find out and also discuss recent talk around the potential collapse of one of Australia's biggest cash transporting businesses. Professor, thanks for your time today. Let's start off with Armagard. It is in a lot of financial trouble. Can those troubles simply be put down to the fact that barely anyone's using cash anymore? Well, it's not a case of nobody using cash. There's less and less people using cash. And so Armagard are concerned with what's called cash in transit business. So there's less and less people using ATMs at the moment, less and less people paying with cash, therefore less and less merchants having to have their cash moved around. Plus, of course, Australia is a huge country and delivering cash to uh, regional and rural areas is increasingly expensive as regards Armadale. So that's their explanation as to why they wanted some more support. If Armagard was to fold, would we notice an impact as consumers? We certainly would because Armagard has about 90% of the cash in transit market. So if they were, if they collapsed or went into liquidation, uh, there'd be less, <laughs> less and more than less, there'd be not much cash, if any, in the ATMs and merchants would be stuck with lots of cash they couldn't pay necessarily into the bank branches because banks sometimes refuse to accept cash as well. So it would turbocharge the uh, move to a cashless society, let's call it that. Well, we're kind of already on that path, aren't we? So is this an inevitability? Are we just going to keep going down this path and Armagard is just the latest symptom of something that's going to happen anyway? I would argue it's not an inevitability, and I would also argue it's something we should try to resist. I think cash can be very useful. We are becoming more and more usable using payment cards and also using digital means to make our transactions. So we have moved distinctly towards the cashless society, but I would personally argue that that would be a big mistake. One reason being that we rely a lot on IT systems and telecoms. They sometimes break down, and if they break down, then the fallback position is using cash. So cash can be very valuable and very useful. 
I do want to continue that discussion in just a couple of minutes, but first I wanted to uh, touch back on Armour Guard. Now, it did knock back a rescue package late last week, $26 million to keep it afloat. Why did it reject the offer? I think that they're trying to play a bit of a game here and look for a much bigger offer, so they just turned it down. Uh, and it was also to do with the fact that the the Australian Banking Association, who led that particular negotiation, uh, were wanting to look at the the books, if you like, of Armour Guard, and that was that, that permission was refused. They don't want to open their books, so. You know, personally, I think, as a personal view, they're just trying to to wait and try and get a better deal out of the uh, Australian banking associations on their side. Pro-cash activists have been getting really vocal of late. On Tuesday, they launched a protest encouraging people to go out and withdraw money from ATMs to kind of send this message that cash is still king and that we still need it. Do actions like this, generally speaking, have much of an impact on moving the needle on the debate and, you know, towards keeping cash rather than going cashless well it would be rather it would be more symbolic than than in many many ways um the figures from the reserve bank of australia show that there was an uptick in the people taking cash out of atms during their last period which i think was probably uh, january's figures there has been a bigger uptake of people obviously getting money out of atms now one reason for that could be that and i would suggest that in the current cost of living crisis people are getting a bit wary about forever tapping on with their card or their digital um, phone whatever and want to see actually what cash what they're paying out for so cash has a very very visible where you can actually see what you're buying and how much it's costing you. Now, um, you know, so I think the idea of that to that particular episode on Tuesday was just to try and remind people that you can get cash out of ATMs and also to try to make a, if you like, a little bit of a point that there's still a lot of people who do rely on cash. All right, let's talk about fans of cash. Now, I personally have noticed a bit of an uptick, uh, especially in uh, my local community specifically, where there are a lot of small businesses uh, of people saying, hey, we need to start using cash again. Cash is king. And then I hear the other side where people kind of uh, denounce people who don't believe in a cashless society as being paranoid or wearing tinfoil hats. Why are they labelled as such? What are their concerns with going cashless and are they justified? Well, I think the concerns are that they might be left high and dry with, in terms of being, not being able to use. The, the, the only option they have is is using cash. Then they perhaps don't have a bank account. They have don't have bank cards. They don't trust them. Whatever. Uh, one of the attractions of, of cash, of course, is its anonymity. Um, no one can track it. No one can detect where it is. Uh, and I would point out that whilst we use cash as a payments mechanism, it's also used as a store of wealth. And there's absolutely a huge amount of cash out there, particularly $150 notes, which people are keeping, if you like, under the mattress. And there's a whole variety of reasons for that. So I think there's the protests, if you like, and the, the, uh, the talk about keeping cash is, is important. And I would say cash is no longer king, but it's still part of the royal family of payments. You mentioned before that you don't think a cashless society in Australia is inevitable, even though that's kind of what our governments are flagging, state and federal, by saying, you know, the future is cashless. How would you see that happening, that we don't go cashless? Because to me, it just feels like everywhere I look, that is that is the inevitability. How could we avoid that? Looking around the rest of the world, as Sweden has been often talked about as the poster child of uh, the cashless society. But even in Sweden, the actual the central bank there has decreed uh, by law that banks must accept cash to people paying it in, and they must also have cash to give out to people. So I think we almost to answer your question, we almost need some kind of uh, intervention from the federal government to say that cash is uh, a viable and a, and a, and a very valuable means of payment as well as a store of wealth and we're going to continue to be uh, having cash around for quite a long time i mean we've also we're seeing i think towards the end of 2030 that will be the end of paper checks so sometimes payment systems payment identities like that do go to have run their life as it were but i think cash has a long long way to go before it becomes extinct 
How long do you think? Because, uh, you know, I've seen some estimates pre-COVID they were saying, you know, it'll take two to three generations. But since COVID where, you know, people were online shopping and there was initially that fear of even exchanging physical cash because of the, you know, uh, infection risk, we did see that kind of speed up in terms of our move to a cashless society. When do you think it will happen, if ever? Well, I would say it's it's going to be at least two or three decades before it ever gets to that extreme. And uh, it may never go out of service, if you like, because I'm sure there'll be some renegades somewhere who are still using cash. This has been in decline. And the, the fall, if, if Armagard were to not be around in the cash and transit business, it would decline rapidly again. But at the moment, I think the government and indeed the Reserve Bank of Australia is keen to keep cash as a payment option. And I think that will, that view will prevail. Whether or not politicians get involved is a tricky question. But I think that, uh, you know, the RBA is actually behind the scenes there, is pushing this, that we have to get a solution to this issue and keep cash availability high. Professor Steve Worthington, thanks so much for your time today and for sharing your expertise with us. We really appreciate it. My absolute pleasure, Sasha. Thank you. And that is all for this morning. Thank you for being here. If you did enjoy this episode, why not share it with someone you think would like it too? And if you want more from us here at The Briefing, follow us on Insta at The Briefing Podcast and check out our stuff on YouTube and TikTok. Search Listener Newsroom. I'm Sasha Barbagat. Thanks for listening. Listener.